The Druk White Lotus School began in 1992 with the villagers of Shea asking their local monastery for help. Their request was supported by Tuxi Rinpoche and taken up by the Gyawang Drukpa. You can think of them as a bishop and an archbishop of a Buddhist lineage. Through an English art teacher, Annie Smith, they found two young architects to help with the design. Jonathan Rose and Duncan Woodburn were both working for Arab at the time. They wanted the design to be culturally appropriate and they wanted it to be sustainable. Design historians would be right to see this as a shift from modernism to postmodernism, which Charles Jenks explains as double coding. The first code is good design and the second code is a culture and a world view rooted in Buddhism. The school, however, is secular and the garden is not a sacred space. There's no contradiction in this because before the East came under Western influence, there was really no distinction between sacred and secular. Both are a part of nature, both are subject to natural law, the Buddha Dharma. The school design was based on a diagram drawn by the spiritual leader of the Drukpa lineage, His Holiness the Gyalwang Drukpa. He drew the diagram in a nomad tent, in a place like this. Buddhist monks learn about diagrams because the Buddha used them to explain his ideas. So as part of their teaching, monks draw and make sand mandalas. The word mandala means cycle and was used for the chapters, the cantos, of the oldest text in any Indo-European language. The Rig Veda was composed about 1500 BC. A great Buddhist scholar, Giuseppe Tucci, explained that a mandala is a map of the cosmos. Cosmos means much the same as universe, but stresses its order rather than its physical character. For Buddhists, the key principles are the Four Noble Truths. The truth of suffering, the truth of the origin of suffering, the truth of the cessation of suffering, and the truth of the Noble Eightfold Path to Enlightenment. Following this path will take you from the world of Samsara, the everyday world, to the world of Nirvana, where you will enjoy peace beyond desire. Some Buddhist schools think Nirvana is attainable on Earth. So, on a mandala diagram, the area outside the ring represents the world of samsara, and the area inside the ring represents the world of Nirvana, reached by earning good karma through good behaviour on Earth. This cosmic geography is also symbolised by the lotus flower. A lotus is born in a sea of mud, and symbolises enlightenment by opening into a world of beauty and sunlight. That's why it's called the White Lotus School. And that's why we hope to have a large paved lotus in the central courtyard. An appreciation of nature is at the heart of the design and at the heart of the school's teaching. The University of Greenwich became involved with the design after a cloudburst and a great flood in 2010. It deposited a metre of mud over the much of the side and destroyed most of the planting. The rain was so hard it cut human flesh. This led to a requirement for a flood protection wall and created a space which could become a garden. As landscape architects, we wanted to grow the mandala idea by including aspects of the everyday world in the design. And we also wanted to reflect the Drukpa heritage in the design. Drukpa means dragon, and the Drukpa emblem shows the treasures of Buddhism protected by two dragons. This led to the first landscape plan by Simon Drury Brown, which has dragon shelter belts forming an enclosure and helping to protect the site from winds and floods. The cultural symbolism is very important, but so are other aspects of the landscape strategy. The first necessity was water. We'd like to have used the traditional Ladakhi system, which is flood irrigation, but it's only 20% efficient, compared to 80% for a drip system. So the drips won. 
the irrigation strategy corresponds to a strategy for soils and vegetation. It's based on hydrozones with different levels of irrigation used to create different habitats. And habitats which correspond to the everyday soil and vegetation types of Ladakh. The integration of water, soils, vegetation and symbols produced the landscape plan. The planting strategy is to use native plants wherever possible, but exotic species where they can do a job which native plants cannot do. Cosmos and marigolds, for example, are popular garden plants in the DAG, with a long flowering season. But native plants from the local area are the best species for the drier hydrozones. The paving strategy also derives from the local environment. The schools in the middle of the Indus Satcha zone. This is the zone of collision between the Indian subcontinent and Laurasia. The impact of the collision released an upsurge of magma which became a granite batholith and is now the Ladakh range. This is where our granite building stone comes from. To the south of the Satcha zone, the Zanskar mountains were formed from the floor of Tethys Ocean. It has been compressed into sedimentary layers and now provides our slate paving. So, in the garden, as in the wider landscape, we will have granite rising out of slate. You could compare this with how, in ancient Egypt, mud was used for dwellings and stone was used to build temples. So, let's have a look at what's been done so far. The school is in the centre of this panorama, beyond the white stupas, with the river Indus, from which India takes its name, flowing through the trees on the right. Geographers describe the landscape as a cold desert. The original idea was to place stupas around the mandala ring. Our present hope is to have four abstract white lotus sculptures, which Richard Deacon has kindly offered to make. The brilliant white outlines of the stupas echo the mountains which rise over 2,000 metres above the school. This clip gives an idea of what the site would be like without irrigation and without vegetation. It'd be a cold desert. Here's a tree-lined avenue watered by kitchen waste, which leads from the site entrance to the present visitor centre. We hope to build a new one. This was the first visit to the nursery by His Eminence and His Holiness, whose full support for the project continues. And here is a first visit by a group of dragons to the Dragon Garden. They're said to live in the abode of snow, the Himalayas. Outdoor wall painting is characteristic of the Himalayan region, and we want to carry the tradition forward. Here are some young dragons in the adventure playground. We could have brought play equipment from elsewhere in India, but it's nicer to make it on site and it can then be maintained on site. As everywhere, children prefer swings and seesaws to static features. You can see a well-designed but hardly used shelter. Believing the sport of car tire rolling was invented here, we hope to create a rough track and to produce world champions. The football pitch is probably in need of some more work, but there's something great about playing among the rocks. Note the tyre rollers. The school used flood irrigation before we had a drip system, and most of the water was lost in the coarse granitic sand. Here's Setan turning on the drip irrigation and then adjusting the drip lines. Drip lines also supply the nursery, which we had to build because few plants are available from commercial nurseries in Ladakh. You can see what may be the world's highest landscape architecture office in the corner of the nursery. The lettering on the stone in the nursery is the most famous Buddhist prayer, Om Mani Padme Hum, Hail to the Jewel of the Lotus. Ornamental grasses have become popular in European gardens. We think this is stiper, but the plants are from Setan's field and weren't labelled. 
He says we could sell bundles of grass for roofing and sweeping for about 500 rupees each. We have about the same number of tourists per year as Woburn Abbey, 60,000, and do not know if they see the waving grass as beautiful or as weeds. Nor do we know if the native plants make the 400 residential children feel more at home in the school. I suspect both groups prefer flowers. Cosmos and Tajitis are Mexican plants, but a popular way of providing colour in Ladaki gardens. The dragon shelter belts will be planted with buckthorn and Himalayan rose. Rosa macrophylla is astonishingly drought tolerant. Here are the infants going for lunch. Shade is very important, not so much because of the heat, but because of the glare. I can hardly go out of doors without a big hat and extra dark sunglasses. You can see sustainability in action here. Organic matter is recycled wherever possible. There's a pile of human manure, kindly supplied by the 800 children. And here are the orchard trees which will supply fruit and then more manure. You can see one of our VIP toilets. That's a ventilated improved pit. Ladakh is famous for its apples. They're stored in deep pits and provide an important source of winter vitamins. We run an annual garden competition with entries from each class. If, as seems possible, Ladakh becomes the Switzerland of India, gardening could become an important transferable skill for the children. The central court in which the garden competition awards are being given out is the proposed location for the disc of white lotus paving we saw earlier. We've made a lookout in the children's playground and we propose a more substantial lookout in the flood wall to let visitors gaze at the fantastic geology and beauty of the Indus Valley landscape. I'll finish with a comment on the design team. I've been involved for almost four years and my impression is of a very friendly, cooperative and effective group. There are several possible reasons. First, and in line with the Buddhist concept of anatta, non-self, we see ourselves as no more than eddies in a flow. The river is what matters. Second, the team follows the principle advocated by the Egyptian architect Hassan Fatih that the designers, the builders and the client must work closely together. Third, and what you see here, is an example of following the advice from Humphrey Repton, the great landscape architecture theorist. He wrote that the plan should be made not only to fit the spot, it ought actually to be made upon the spot. So the best thing is to turn off your computers, get down on your knees and draw. <laughs>